Criminology Project, in conjunction with the American Society of Criminology, is pleased to present the conversation with John Hagen. Uh, we're fortunate enough to join him from his office here at Northwestern uh, University on February 24, 2015. Uh, before we get started, I think it's appropriate to, to offer a rendition. Uh, the challenge for me is to come back uh, his enormous vita into a couple of highlights here. Uh, so John began his uh, scholastic career at the University of Illinois, earning a bachelor's degree in sociology before pursuing a doctorate uh, under the direction of Gwen Nettler, uh, one, of, one of the greats in the field, uh, earning a PhD in sociology at the University of Alberta in 1974. Uh, some of his early academic appointments were both in law schools as well as sociology programs, uh, two in particular uh, worthy of mention, uh, the University of North Carolina, as well as the University of Wisconsin. Uh, today, he holds uh, uh, several positions, uh, two academic appointments, uh, one here at the University of Northwestern, as I mentioned earlier, where he's the John D. MacArthur Professor of Sociology and Law, uh, where he's been, he's been here since 1999. Uh, also holds an appointment as University Professor Emeritus of Law and Sociology at the University of Toronto uh, from 2004 to present. He had a couple of appointments there. Uh, my uh, and you also serve here in Chicago as co-director and research professor at the Center of Law and Globalization at the American Bar Foundation, uh, also held that appointment since 1999. Uh, during his lengthy career, John has earned quite a few accolades um, according to the field. He's been, uh, he served as the American Society of Criminology President in 1990, uh, offered a presidential address uh, on the poverty of classlessness uh, in criminology, uh, pointing in the field in some directions there that uh, he thought were important. Uh, hopefully, highlight some of those uh, some of those themes in the course of the interview. He's also earned the ASC's Edwin Sutherland Award, which is kind of tantamount to a kind of a lifetime achievement award in a sense for the accumulation uh, of work that he's uh, responsible for publishing. The Stockholm Prize in 2009, which has been in many ways analogized to the Nobel Prize for Criminology. He's an elected fellow at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2010. He's also earned the Harry J. Calvin Jr. Prize for Outstanding Scholarship by the Law and Society Association. And he's also been elected fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He's also held a number of named appointments uh, for, scholars, uh, for scholars, the Russell Sage Foundation. Uh, he served as a visiting scholar at one point. He's also been a fellow, a named fellow at the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, and he's been an invited fellow at the Center for Advanced Study of Behavioral Sciences. John's responsible for having put out 198 peer-reviewed articles, 19 edited books, uh, either authored or co-authored or edited, uh, and 100 book chapters, reprints of uh, some of the scholarly work that you put out in uh, peer-reviewed publications, served as editor of the annual reveal Annual Review of Law and Social Sciences uh, for 2006 to 2010, editor of one of my favorite series uh, within the field, of The Crime of Society, uh, the West, Westview Press, put out a couple that uh, line my shelves and line the shelves of many who are reviewing this, uh, served as co-editor of the Annual Review of Sociology from 1993 to 2004. His work spreads well beyond the confines of criminology proper. Um, excited to talk about some of those aspects. Uh, in terms of some of the themes, some of the topics that he's uh, discussed over the course of his career, focused attention on over the course of his career, um, some of the theoretical aspects responsible for uh, putting forth the power control theory, uh, which is on sort of the critical criminology end of the spectrum, if you will, uh, gender, some developmental aspects appear in, in quite, a, uh, quite a few of your works. Uh, there's an, any number of topics, and I've, I've, I've struggled to fit these within sort of discrete elements here, uh, so I apologize if I've left anything out. International law, race, and gender inequality, uh, social capital, you've coined the term criminal capital uh, that's, that's appeared in the literature from time to time. I've spent time talking about imprisonment, uh, mass incarceration binge, uh, war, uh, war crimes, state atrocities, genocide, uh, an emerging element of your real repertoire these days. Uh, comparative sociology, developmental pathways, uh, homelessness, perceptions of injustice, um, white collar crime. Um, we just had a brief little bit here off camera here. Um, they authored a really uh, interesting book by Princeton University Press called Who Are the Criminals, which is kind of a 
set in a sort of a sociology of knowledge vein in terms of how policy interacts with the uh, how policy interacts with the sort of political uh, scene writ large. Uh, in addition to who are the criminals, he's authored any number of, of other books that uh, have won some distinctions. Um, Darfur and uh, the Crime of Genocide, co-authored with uh, a former student of his, Winota Ryman Richmond, uh, has won awards from the American so uh, Sociological Association, uh, the, uh, namely the Albert J. Reese Distinguished Scholar Award, as well as the ASC uh, bestowed upon it uh, the Michael J. Hindelang Award. Uh, your book, Northern Passage, which is somewhat autobiographical in a sense, uh, the preface uh, kind of outlines your, uh, your story and then leads us into a, a discussion of uh, uh, the Lives of American Vietnam Resisters in Canada. Uh, fascinating bit of work. That also earned the Al J. Reese uh, Distinguished Scholar Award from the ASA. Mean Streets, uh, a book that offered also co-authored with a, uh, a former student, uh, Bill McCarthy, won the Michael J. Hinderling Award from the ASC, as well as the C. Wright Mills uh, Award from the Society for the Study of Social Problems, Triple SP. Uh, in concluding the book, uh, end of the spectrum here, uh, You've uh, authored a book called Structural uh, Criminology that's won a number of awards as well, the ASA Crime, Law and Deviance Distinguished Scholar Award, the Triple SP Crime and Delinquency Outstanding Scholarship Award. Um, and with that, um, I think it might be appropriate to start our story from the, the point uh, at which you began your foray into the field. Um, can you walk us through the progression of how you got to, got from being just a, a young undergraduate in, in Al Bandura's class at the University of Illinois to, to Gwen Nettler, and then into criminology, from sociology to criminology there in terms of mm. its relationship to your biography. Okay, well, thank you. It's <laughs> a uh, pleasure to talk with you. Um, yeah, I, I began my uh, career, I guess, as an undergraduate at the University of Illinois. Maybe I laugh when I say that because I was pretty undistinguished student there the first couple of years. Uh, uh, my parents were academics and, uh, you know, there's something in criminology, there are a lot of, um, especially in early criminology, there are a lot of uh, the children of, uh, of uh, ministers uh, and pastors and maybe I was the opposite, I don't know. Uh, and uh, I got quite intrigued at the University of Illinois with um, a the criminologist, sociologist David Borgia, who was uh, oh, I, doing interesting yes. uh, work on uh, crime theory and uh, did a lot of work on the police, and uh, I was completely intrigued with with him and what he had done. Uh, and um, uh, so I so I started to do work in criminology, and that really that's what got me excited about being a college student. <laughs> and so my last uh, couple of years at the University of Illinois, I did a lot better. And uh, then the Vietnam War came along, yeah. and um, I wasn't going to participate in that. It didn't make sense to me. Uh, I was involved in some of the demonstrations and so on. And um, so uh, that got me really thinking about, you know, what is crime and deviance all about? And sort of my... Uh, refusal to go into the military if I'd been drafted, ultimately I never was, yeah. but if I had been I wouldn't have gone and uh, I had ultimately went to Canada and that's how my draft board I think knew that I wasn't uh, wasn't going to serve yeah. and uh, I'm curious, were you at the Chicago uh, scene in 68? I actually was uh, in Grand Park uh, the <laughs> day before what has been called the police riot yes. occurred, yeah. and uh, I just come back from being in Toronto. I was sort of, sort of looking, uh -huh. think about where I might go in Canada, uh, and uh, so I think my draft board decided I wasn't coming back, and they were right about that. A friend yeah. of mine had gone where I went at the University of Alberta in Edmonton the year before I did, and wound up renouncing his citizenship. And uh, so they gave me some sort of deferment, like the day before they got rid of occupational deferments, and I never understood. I didn't ask for it, but they gave it to me. Okay. You know, there's so many different stories about yeah. people's service and not service. Uh, All right. Be no more. So I'd, I'd gone to Canada, and I knew I wanted to go to graduate school, and uh, uh, I knew I wanted to study criminology. Yeah. And actually, University of Alberta had a pretty strong program. Gwen Nettler, who okay. you mentioned, yes. uh, was there who is just in the process of writing this book, Explaining Crime. So that was very exciting for me. I got 
totally involved and excited about doing criminology and um, I wound up staying in Canada for about 25 years, uh, 25, 30 years, depending on how you count, and uh, then came back to Northwestern University. So, um, so both David Borgia and Glenn Nettler were early mentors. Okay. They're both um, maybe in political terms more to the conservative side of the discipline, and that wasn't where I was, yeah. but uh, it, it really challenged me and made me think about things. And both of them were very open-minded and uh, um, encouraged me in what I wanted to do, so that's how I got started. Okay. Uh, were there any initial interests in legality? Uh, did you see yeah. that as a separate issue, or, or was it handled under the same broad rubric? It was definitely all about legality. Okay. And um, so, you know, among, just in, in terms of the decision to go to Canada, there were the Drafter sisters, which I would okay. have been a part of if I'd gotten drafted, and they decided to stay anyway for a long time. And then there were the mili what we called the military resistors, what Americans call deserters. Uh, and that was definitely, and, yeah. you know, so both were challenges to legality, okay. and one more severe than the other. And uh, the, the, the military resistors were really interesting to me, a real role okay. model in terms of, you know, taking taking a chance, uh, leading a different life. And, um, you mentioned I wrote a book called Northern Passage, yes. um, American Vietnam War Resistors in Canada, which was based on interviews with a hundred resistors who stayed in Toronto for a long period, probably permanently, mostly. Uh, and uh, to a person, they all would say uh, that going to Canada was the best thing that could have happened to them. Okay. Uh, it was a place they felt like they fit, and they yeah. always better politically. And uh, so that made me think about legality in okay. a very serious way. And I always knew that I wanted to do something on uh, war crimes, international criminal law, from the outset. Okay. But, um, you know, when I started, sort of, when I finished my PhD in 1975, um, inter -criminal, international criminal law was an idea, yeah. it was a theory. Right. You know, it had an early sort of crucial beginning at yes. Nuremberg after the Second World War. All right. But then the United States and, and the Soviet Union both kind of decided it wasn't in their interests on yeah. either side <laughs> to sort of pursue this because they could both get caught up in the net of international yeah. criminal law. And so it wasn't until, you know, the fall of the Soviet Union yeah. in, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, that international criminal law re-emerged. Okay. And it re-emerged uh, at the Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia yeah. and the Tribunal for Rwanda. And uh, that, that ultimately became my way to find my way back into my interest about international okay. criminal law, international conflict, war, and crime. Uh, but, uh, you know, that was, that was uh, 20 years yeah. after I finished graduate school when, when uh, those two tribunals were set up. Um, so for a long period I worked on, uh, I worked on prosecution and sentencing, yeah. wrote a number of articles uh, about, uh, about criminal sentencing and uh, did my work on, on homeless youth and so on. Uh, and uh, in some ways all of that was a lead up to what became really the period when I was able to do the work that first brought me to the field. Okay. Uh, you, uh, you referenced a, a, the Nuremberg trial there, and I, I remember a, an article that you wrote that uh, highlighted the, uh, the, the vital work that would, had been done by, uh, by Dr. Book. Uh, as being sort of emblematic. It, exactly. It, it, it managed to merge the criminological aspect with sort of the legal aspect yeah. of things. Do you think the field sees those as, yeah. as distinct or are they bifurcated elements? Is that to our disadvantage that they might be? That's a really good question. Uh, Sheldon Gluck was a really interesting figure because he had escaped before uh, the Holocaust really occurred. Yeah. He was very much aware of it. And yeah had family members affected by it and so on. And uh, so for a period, Gluck was very involved. He wrote a book about international criminal law. Yeah. He wrote an important Harvard Law Review article. He participated in the planning for the Nuremberg trials. Uh, he, like other Jewish academics, weren't really encouraged to be involved in those trials. Uh, uh, Justice Robert Jackson, who oversaw the American involvement 
in those trials, I was worried that if uh, there was a prominence of American Jews in the prosecutions, that it would uh, challenge or impugn the objectivity. Uh, I think it was a very misguided sort of position to take. Uh, but, um, but it meant that it was really kind of, in the end, Sheldon Gluck uh, sort of hit a wall yeah. in terms of what he could do. And he began to realize that actually also Americans, you know, they'd seen our country be involved in World War II. Yeah. They knew in some way, limited way, about the Holocaust, but everyone was ready to move on. Okay. Maybe a little bit like after Vietnam or after Iraq. All right. uh, after kind of prolonged involvements of lengthy wars of that kind that tax our country so much, there's a desire to sort of, uh, in some ways, forget about what's happened and okay. uh, not remember it, and yeah. especially the bad parts, okay. and to move on. And um, that really helped, happened for Bullock, and he realized right. he was going to have to have a different career. Okay. And so he began his work on uh, longitudinal research on delinquents. Uh, right. Was the, the way in which Sheldon and Eleanor Bullock are best known yes. for their work on that project. Uh, but there was this earlier phase where he was very prominent yeah. in terms of, uh, of the first uh, sort of birth of international criminal law. Huh. And then in the same way, you know, that even later in, in my career, you know, when I finished graduate school, there wasn't really an area of work that you yeah. could do um, in, in, in a similar way. I, I experienced a later phase of that. Okay. And, um, uh, so that, that was an important lesson for me that I was intrigued to discover later on when I, when I started to do this work in yeah. international criminal law. Uh, an earlier conversation that, that you and I had, um, speaking of work that sort of serve as an archetype in a way, or a, a template that kind of illustrate larger points, uh, you pointed to the work of, uh, of Edwin Sullivan, not his theoretical work in, in terms of differential association, but rather his work on white collar crime exactly. as being the thing that you look to as sort of a, a, a guidepost, not for it being white collar crime, although that is of interest to you, but more in the light of it being him opening up or broadening the horizons for, for criminology and opening up a, a new realm. That's right. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of the yeah. some of the difficulties or some of the challenges that you faced over the course of your career in, in opening up, trying to draw the field's attention into these areas? Yeah. Um, well. Yes. Exactly. As I said, um, there really wasn't an area there to work on yeah. in, in international criminal law, and that always struck me as ironic because. I took Sutherland's great contribution, and I still think it is the greatest contribution in turning uh, criminology in a new direction, was to focus people's attention on white collar crime, yeah. uh, which hadn't really been done in a major way. Yeah. So people like Gil Geis and others had done some, some work, but Sutherland was the, the one who named it yeah. and got people looking at it in a really serious way. And a part of that involved his reaction to the fact that American corporations had been process, had been identified as trading with the enemy yes. during the Second World War. So, so war and international uh, criminal law, it was there all right. in his book on white car crime. But he also saw, like Sheldon Gluck at yeah. that same point in the 1950s, yeah. they both saw that this wasn't what America wanted to focus on. All right. And uh, so you can look at, you know, one way of seeing this is the great journalist David uh, Halberstrom. If you if you look at his book on the 1950s, yeah. you go to the index, there's nothing about the Holocaust. There's huh. nothing about war crimes. Yeah. You know, and yet that, that was such part of people's experience who, <laughs> whose lives unfolded in the 1950s. They were yeah. living in the aftermath of that. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, so Sutherland didn't pick up on international criminal law. Yeah. But he, he, dr he drastically changed our understanding yes. of criminology by putting the focus on white collar crime. Yeah. And he understood, he understood what, the way he could change criminology. Yeah. And at that time and in that place, it was white collar crime. Yeah. It wasn't international criminal law. Both Gluck and Sutherland, these two leading figures for which two of our major awards in the American yeah. Society of Criminology are named, they both were actually confronting international criminal law, yeah. but in a way turning away from it okay. uh, in organizing their work. And so Sutherland's life work then became about white collar crime. Yeah. Uh, and Gluex became about uh, the longitudinal study of delinquency and crime. Okay.
I'm wondering if out on the frontiers there, and you're kind of leading the charge or pioneering some aspect of, of criminology, uh, does it ever get lonely, or, or how do you manage that, uh, the smuggling in of ideas or the conveying of ideas out? How does that, how does one cultivate a, a new and interesting aspect of the field and then energize the field in that direction, motivate? The loneliness of a long distance runner here on the latter <laughs> stages of my career. So <laughs> running, trying to run. Trying to run. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, um, that's, a, that's a very useful question because it, you know, so many of us came into the field uh, with backgrounds that were undistinguished, if not deviant. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, um, and, 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 and came to sociology as well as criminology through yeah. mind study, crime, crime and deviance. Um, so your question is, do I feel lonely? No, yeah. I love being in this field where you could be different, where you could do, always ask me questions. All right. And maybe the field wasn't always asking the questions I wanted to ask, but yeah. that was kind of better for me because I like that. Oh, right. I like to be different. I okay. like, you know, it's, um, it's, it's uh, you always look for new ways to open up, open doors, okay. and open up understanding. And for criminology, you know, it was so interesting to me that before Sutherland, we weren't studying white collar crime, yeah. which remains, you know, among the top one or two most important topics yeah. that criminology should be studying. Yeah. And we weren't studying more crimes, which I would put right alongside of white collar crime. So I. I'm very conscious of the opportunity to do that and okay. new fields to conquer, you know, new things to do. Okay. Uh, and a field that was willing to at least tolerate them being done. Uh, so, uh, so you know, some people sometimes probably say, well, why is he studying that? Yeah. And uh, but that, that's fine. That's okay. a good question to ask. Yeah. I like being asked that question. So <laughs> uh, I always felt that this was a field loaded with a opportunity and, right. and always new things to do, you know, okay. cyber crime or you yeah. know, whatever, drones, you know, there's always <laughs> something new that's happening uh, and that's a part of the excitement of the field. Okay. Uh, sometimes when I ask questions to the effect of, do you see these papers or these, these phases of your career as dedicated to different topics? Some people say that no, 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 that's, that's all part of a uniform agenda here. Now, is my splitting things up into, what, 37 different kind of flavors of ice cream here, flavors of John Hagen here? Is that a misconception, or is there one unifying aspect there that kind of, kind of draws things together? I've always been interested in class, crime, war, and power. Okay. Those kinds of things, which are very interconnected. Yes. So, I don't I appreciate identifying that I've done a lot of yeah. different things, yeah. but I also see them as all tied together. Okay. And, uh, you know, so when I, you know, as I mentioned, when I began, I was interested in studying international criminal law. I was interested that I was in some ways, you know, sort of part of a criminal movement yeah. in terms of going to Canada. Yeah. Uh, but people really weren't really interested and ready to hear about that. And we didn't know how it was going to turn out. Yeah. You know, back then, none of us knew. Well, you actually you did. Out. You did. Now we don't. You did your right. dissertation on, on First Nations and their, exactly. their relationship so, with power structures that be... The exactly. Project. So I thought, oh, okay, I'm in Canada. You know, yeah. I'm in a part of Canada where there are a lot of Native people, First Nations people, okay. Aboriginal people. Uh, they're in jail yeah. in extraordinary numbers, mainly for not being able to pay fines, which we now identify as a big problem for okay. minorities in the United States. We didn't then. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do this stuff. I'll, I'll study, yeah. you know... Uh, criminal justice in the Canadian province. Well, uh, it was naive in a sense that on the one hand, theoretically it makes sense, but Americans just aren't that interested <laughs> in criminal justice in the province of Alberta. Yeah. But, uh, but it was a way for me to get into studying courts and law. Right. And you, as you said in the beginning, legality, yeah. Yeah. crime and law, that's what it all, it's all about for me. Okay. And uh, I was able, I was able to, to, for a long time, you know, sort of at least uh, address my interest in the connection between crime and law by studying courts. Okay. And uh, then when I went to the University of Toronto as an assistant professor and spent 20, 30 years there, uh, I got a lot of support, uh, not just in terms of being a sociologist and a criminologist, yeah. but also in terms of being in the faculty of law there. All right. And um, the, the deans that, that helped me in, in the law school during that time 
uh, introduced me to people who were involved in, yeah. in doing important things on the Supreme Court of Canada and in the criminal courts. Okay. And I had colleagues who played a prominent role in, for example, bail reform. Yeah. Uh, I had a colleague who was very important in terms of doing that. Uh, so, uh, so there were lots of opportunities, yeah. and, and uh, I saw it as sort of one unfolding sort of program of research, but it did have different sort of, uh, I always remember Jim Shortwolf's introducing me at a session or something, he said, God, this guy sure is curious about a lot of different things, and, uh, and, and that was so like Jim Short, you know, because he stayed very focused on gang delinquency. All right. And um, and that you know he had he had a point. I know he was sort of saying, you, can you really do all these different things? And it's better to do one thing well yeah. than a thousand things less well. And you know you can argue both sides of that. But I, I so, appreciate it. What what do you think? giving you some measure of success in these? Is it a methodology? Is it the is it a perspective? Is it a framework that that allows you to simply take your toolkit and kind of pull up stakes and set up camp in a new, in a new yeah. area? You know, two people's careers that had a big impact on me were Travis Fershey and Eric Olin Wright. Okay. Very different people. Yeah. One radical, one more conservative, yeah. one criminologist, one sociologist of class. Yeah. But what they both did was they took very basic methods of causal analysis and quantitative data okay. and they matched them to big theoretical questions. Wow. And uh, so I could see from the beginning that that was our, our discipline of, of criminology was emerging and yeah. maturing as a discipline, and part of it was gaining respectability. And one of the things we could bring to the study of crime that was unique was uh, the advances in social science methods right. and, uh, and techniques. So okay. self-report surveys, a yeah. uh, big part of survey science, uh, social surveys, um, the use of causal modeling and quantitative methods yeah. to understand what is a cause, you know, Hershey's original book, Causes of Delinquency. Yeah. I was very much uh, trailing along, and, and uh, from the beginning I was, you know, I realized that I was kind of in a bit of uh, off track, at least, in northern Alberta, uh, and, and, and so I looked for role models in America as well as in Canada, All right. and so in addition to Gwen Nettler being there and being a very important person for me and Austin Turtley yeah. at the University of Toronto. Uh, I was very focused on people like Travis Hershey and Stan Wheeler, yeah. who uh, taught in the law school at Yale, and Al Reese, who kind of mixed law and crime uh, work. Uh, I was very focused on these people, and um, I remember early on as a graduate student, I wrote Travis Hershey a letter. And uh, he answered it, <laughs> and he remained a friend, uh, still is, uh, throughout my career. Yeah. And uh, so these, and Stan Wheeler became a friend. Yeah. Um, has a lot to do with, had a lot to do with the American Bar Foundation and the Russell Sage Foundation. Right. Early work on law and crime right. uh, there, and uh, so so I had these sort of imported or export <laughs> role models or something that were very, very important for me, especially Stan Wheeler because. He proved, Stan Wheeler was this guy who had talk about a variety of interests. Yeah. This guy went to undergraduate school uh, on a golf scholarship. Uh, he played uh, the saxophone and a clarinet, I forgot, in a jazz band. Uh, his his uh, wife was a journalist of the New York Times. Yeah. So he was interested in journalism. And he actually was a professor. You know, so he did all these different things. In particular, he did it in law school. Yeah. And that's how I got interested in being both in sociology and law, right. and uh, followed that path. And uh, yeah. since I didn't have all those other kinds of talents that <laughs> Stan did, I, I concentrated my work on you know, yeah. a variety of topics in criminology. Yeah, in some ways this fits with the larger overall theme of this project in general and accumulating criminological capital in some sense. Criminological capital. Yeah, right. what a great professional, professional capital. Uh, you speak of... You know, you know Bourdieu would very much like that. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's the idea of uh, both study ourselves or we're studying what we study. And Correct. How does that go? And that's what I was trying to do yeah. with the criminals in my recent book yeah. about theories and policies of crime trying to think about how do careers unfold as yes. you are doing this important yeah. oral history work. Um, and uh, trying to understand uh, 
both the how criminals create capital and how criminologists do too. Yeah. Yeah. You you speak in a bit of a way of being kind of a, sort of off the map in some sense, like almost quite literally I was there. Literally with being, off with the being, map. But it, I was that, 500 miles north of the border. Right? It's colder than it is today. Yeah, <laughs> I, I could have gone to Fort McMurray. <laughs> but you know. but it, I, when I look at some of the premier works in just the sociological canon, just in general, I, I still have a warm place in my heart for De Tocqueville. Uh, mm. And could it be that that actually served as a, a as a seminal advantage for you, being an outsider and having a completely different perspective? Uh, and yeah. things, but that international aspect gives you some some advantage. Uh, yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, anyone who's lived outside the United States begins to think about the United States in a different way. I yeah. Think. Um, it it really does open your eyes to the fact that this is one country. Yeah. In a big world, and an awfully important country, and one I'm glad to do my work in because yeah. it's so exciting and stimulating, even if I disagree with so much of what it does. Sure. Uh, but being outside the country really uh, made me look at it differently. Yeah. And always thinking about comparisons between Canada and the United States are very different countries in terms of the way they approach crime. Yeah. Um, um, and uh, so that that was uh, fascinating, a fascinating part of things for me to okay. see how what America does with crime looks different. Yeah. Uh, from the outside, as contrasted with the inside. Um, so I always felt advantaged. By that night, I can remember uh, at a certain stage in my career when I was moving along and I had the opportunity to be on several um, uh, National Academy of Sciences panels uh, related to crime and delinquency. I always come to these, you know, they're in Washington and yeah. sometimes they meet at the National Academy on the, on the mall or yeah, the institution right. there, yeah. you know, whatever. And uh, Einstein's statue there is in the front, and you go in, you learn that this National Academy was started by Abraham Lincoln, and you have big portraits. And I remember, uh, I remember at least one Attorney General came to one of those meetings, Janet Reno. Yeah. And uh, so I'd sit there and think, oh, well, I'm a Canadian citizen as well as an American citizen, and actually I'm going back tonight to Toronto, and I'm going to see all my colleagues at law school who think very yeah. little about the United States except to criticize it. And are very interested, you know, as, as lawyers are yeah. in their own country's law. Uh, so I'd say to myself, you know, this is very interesting. I yeah. think it's sort of, it's sort of like watching two soap operas at the same time. <laughs> there was the Canadian political soap opera and the American look. You could watch Trudeau, you could watch Clinton, you know. <laughs> and so I was, I was very conscious of sort of occupying a position that allowed me to look at things with a little more detachment okay. and could be a little more free actor in doing it. You know, I wasn't, you know, it wasn't so much, you know, okay, how am I going to get someday to be head of a National Academy of Science of Talent? I never thought that would happen. Yeah. It yeah. hasn't. <laughs> but, uh, but I think, you know, I didn't really, you know, I thought that, okay, I, you know, I have a diff little bit different life here. Yeah. Um, and yeah. it makes me, it gives me a little more freedom to think about things in a different way. Now, you, you've crossed a couple of different boundaries here too, I guess professionally, in terms of having a law appointment, typically, yeah. in conjunction with a, a sociology appointment. Yeah. Does criminology look different than those settings? Are the, are the mm -hmm. academic approaches different? Can you speak to us a little bit about um, those contrasts, as well as maybe some of the convergences? Well, yeah, I think what the law... I would get frustrated that law sometimes, no, mainly, mostly, yeah. got down in the weeds and yeah. you know legal arguments about the small, what seemed to me often small and petty things. Okay. But I was also very conscious that law could um, be a tremendous educational device. All right. People learn about what's right and wrong through law, and that particularly applies maybe in international criminal law. Yeah. I would think. Uh, and um, so, so there are different ways of sort of looking at things. Yeah, but it made me, you know, conscious of the fact that sometimes you have to start with a definition. So, and ironically, I remember in doing the, the work on Darfur and the crime of genocide, it was my co-author, Winona Rahman Richmond, who kept saying, um, you know, John, you have to start this book. You have to start with the definition of genocide. Yes. And so oh, wow. we go back and do that. And yeah. of course, you know, there are all these characteristics. The contentious you know, debate. Contentious yeah. debate about what is yeah. genocide. And yeah. that became a whole point of the book. So maybe I I wouldn't have believed uh, my colleague, my co-author, 
went on, I, have, uh, I hadn't spent more time in law school. She somehow came to that realization more easily. I had to be sort of surrounded by people pounding away at me all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you've also, uh, th does American criminology look different abroad than it does from sort of an insider's perspective too? Of course it does, and, yeah. and, and it, it begins with the name of our prominent organizations, yeah. you know, the American Society of Criminology, yeah. the American Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences. Yeah. Uh, um, at least we didn't name our journal the American Journal of Criminology, <laughs> and uh, so maybe, you know, and, and there's always been a, a part of criminology that was international, yeah. uh, and I think it's becoming more and more apparent. Okay. You know, we live in a global world, we're now more inclined to realize that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I do think criminology looks different from within than okay. without, and uh, there are features of our field that, you know, other criminologists in other countries wonder about. For example, the tremendous emphasis we put on quantitative methods. Yeah. It both has been a, a great source of prestige for the evolution of our field. Yeah. Looking at things quantitatively makes you ask questions you wouldn't otherwise and opens you to facts you wouldn't acknowledge yeah. or understand otherwise. But maybe being so preoccupied with, with quantitative approaches, uh, as C. Wright Mills noted, you know, it can be a form of, what did he call it, empirical abstraction, I think. Yeah. Abstracted empiricism. Um, you know, scholars, criminologists in other countries, I think, are a little more, more likely to sort of say, well, you know, there's some basic questions here that we yeah. keep have to go go back to, and not maybe like the lawyers get too caught up in in the intricacies of particular methods. You uh, in an earlier conversation, you also mentioned that uh, sociology, in your estimation, at that point had much a, a more a more of a niche for qualitative kinds of ventures. Yeah. Uh, do you still see that as a contrast between sociology and criminology? Could you speak to some of the differences between? Sociology, soci criminology that happens in sociology versus criminology that happens in CJC departments. Yeah, um, I think there's always sort of been a strong qualitative streak within criminology from Sutherland to the present. Yeah. Uh, it was just the other day I was looking back at people who have done case studies, and Daryl Stephens Meyer is one of our most uh -huh. distinguished criminologists. He did classic case studies, you know individuals and, uh, and looked at things through that lens as well as a much more larger survey-based quantitative official record lens. Uh, so it's always been important, but I think today it's becoming more important yeah. uh, somehow. And actually you can see kind of a, a bit of, you can see a split in our field between people who study, I remember, I remember a young scholar saying to me once, uh, you know, I, she, she said, I'm one of the punishment people. And what she was referring to was that she felt more at home in the Law and Society Association uh -huh. than, than the American Society of Criminology. And I never sort of, I felt at home in both places. Yeah. And I always come back to criminology. That's always the sort of base starting point for me. But, but I can see that um, some, some younger scholars in particular see more of an opening for a quantitative, I'm sorry, a qualitative yeah. criminology in sociology and a law and society scholarship. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I think it's more and more finding its way in criminology too, okay. you know. You can't, uh, you know, the biggest selling criminology book at the most uh, must be Alice Hoffman's On the Run. Yeah. And uh, if it's not, it's Michelle Alexander's uh, The New Jim, Jim Crow. Crow. Well, these are not quantitative works, yes. although there are quantitative dimensions to Alice Hoffman's work. Um, but um, young scholars, uh, uh, the, the, the new uh, uh, scholar who wrote the Stick Up Kids, uh, great book. Um, uh, you know, there's lots of quali great quality yeah. criminology happening there. Um. Has there been any movement uh, in the wake of your presidential address to, to bring, I guess, notions of power and, and class back into the field as maybe an organizing mechanism? I'd like to think it was yeah. me, but yeah. I don't think so. Yeah. Well, you also, <laughs> but I do think, yeah. I do think, you know, it coincided. You're talking about my presidential address, yes. yeah. the American Society of Criminology, the poverty of classes criminology. Yeah. Um, 
I do like to think that I was seeing something that was happening, which was, you know, sort of beginning in the 1970s, yeah. and especially at the end of the last century and now into this century, we have this widening gap of inequality. Yeah. So I think I was, you know, sort of moving alongside that. And I think it's the, the extraordinary inequality in our society yeah. today that is has progressively awakened more criminologists to the, the impact of criminology. And so you see the very biggest sort of figures in our field, like Rob Sampson and Bruce Western and Ruth Peterson, all kinds of scholars, yeah. you know, really focusing their work around inequality and if it's neighborhood inequality or yeah. inequality in the justice system and so on. It's 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 now you know sort of an indelible part of our field. Yeah. Um, so when you look back and you kind of survey, I guess the, the totality of your work uh, when it's all said and done. Are there a couple of pieces that, that hold kind of a special place that you, in your heart, that you kind of said that that's the one I'm most satisfied with? That's the one that I really, I really had it pinned down. Is there a body of work, a, one or two pieces, a book? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm still um, crazy enough to think that my best work is before me, <laughs> and I'm just finishing book uh, yeah. about kind of Iraq and the crimes of aggressive war which for me uh, is sort of, you know, I, I see uh, the Vietnam War and the Iraq War as yeah. two violent kind of bookends of my generation. Huh. And I see uh, our remembering accurately the Iraq War yeah. as a war of aggression, which I think I argue in the book and I firmly <laughs> believe is what it was. Yeah. Uh, that that's extraordinarily important as it repeats the lessons of Vietnam and if no other generation should know these lessons and pass them on to the next generation it should be ours and okay. be better than a criminologist to say it's a war of aggression uh, it's, a, it's a war crime it's an inter a violation of international criminal law yeah what Justice Robert Jackson our Nuremberg uh, prosecutor yeah. and Supreme Court Justice and extraordinary figure in international criminal law, what he said was the most important uh, extreme violation of criminal law, uh, war of aggression. Uh, so so um, I, I um, you know, before I began the work on international criminal law as well, I was able to do this book, Northern Passage, about American Vietnam War Resisters. Yeah. I see that as very much a war, um, and I got a, a, an award, a yeah, sure. recent award, that reflected that it was a part of criminology All as right. well as sociology. And so that, that book, uh, the book with um, Bill McCarthy, uh, Mean yeah. Streets, uh, was very important to me. Uh, because it uh, underlined the importance of not just studying what we find in official statistics, yeah. but getting out there on the streets and doing the work on the streets that uh, was qualitatively an important part of that work and could not have happened without, without Bill McCarthy. Yeah. I always told Bill McCarthy that um, he looked like a cross between James Taylor and Clint Eastwood, <laughs> and if anyone could interview the street kids, it was the person who looked like those two people. Uh, both simultaneously, uh, and uh, that was such an exciting piece of research for yeah. me, and, and and sort of had this comparative angle in terms yeah. of kind of the more and the qualitative well, elements in the and the very much out there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so Dark War and the Crime of Genocide, uh, the work with Manana Ryman Richmond, yeah. was extremely important for me. It, it would not have the qualitative strength without the ethnographic yeah. input of Winona and her persistence on, on actually getting the numbers right. Yeah. Uh, Winona worked with me uh, to get uh, estimates of the mortality and to get that yeah. uh, part of the public discourse. And the number we wound up with between 300 and 400,000 is the number that is still uh, cited today in terms of dark horror, what yeah. people do remember. Is that that's, that horror. appeared in science, correct? That did appear in yeah. science, yeah. And um, Alberto Cloney was co-author on that work yeah. uh, as well. Um, uh, I wrote a book called Who Are the Criminals? Uh, that tries to sort of give my perspective uh, on the field yeah. and the link between theory and policy from Roosevelt through Reagan to Obama. That's been important for me and now the, the book yeah. on Iraq. So, 
you know, and I want to, of course, think that uh, that, that, that book that's coming here in the spring of 2015 will be, you know, as good or better than the work yeah. that came before. So I'm noticing book, 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 book. Mm -hmm. uh, is there is there too much emphasis maybe on peer review publications as sort of a fixation on that? Maybe maybe that that's my word, but. Um, I just, it, what about the balance between the bigger ideas that the new appearing books versus? I like big ideas. Yeah. And I like the, you know, the, when I did the book on Northern Passage, I wanted to write the book, you know, back there when we went to libraries. Yeah. I wanted it to be the book <laughs> on the shelf that you went to to understand <laughs> my people, you know, yeah. when we went to Canada to resist the war. Uh, and it was important to get it published for me with Harvard University Press yeah. and to have it to be there on the bookshelf. Well, I guess now you can maybe look at it in part on through Google oh, or something. Yeah. Or you might even look at the book and there are a couple of articles. But um, so books have a, a role in, in, in writing an international criminal law. I did, I'd done three books that I, I wanted to sort of be a trilogy and Okay. And I wanted them to have a force that maybe three books would have. All right. Um, uh, so Justice in the Balkans, the Darfur book, and the Iraq book. Um, but I don't see one as more important than the other. All right. I, I try to do both. Okay. Um, they are different ways of writing. Yeah. They are different ways of writing. And sometimes one or two of my students have said, you know, Gee, I think your writing's changed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's, interesting. that's an interesting yeah. part of things. Um, uh, but fortunately, I have enormously talented co authors, Josh Kaiser and Anna Hansen, on the new book on Iraq, uh, who sort of you know, have helped me think about that. Right. Uh, and I tried to help them think about how do you write a journal article versus a book. Okay. And, um, I do enjoy write, uh, writing the books now, yeah. especially, and I hope I'll do one on um, on uh, mass incarceration, probably with, with Holly Foster, who has done a lot of work on mass incarceration with me, and very important in that work. Uh, you've mentioned a couple of co-authors who are who, who have also been at an earlier stage in their career, former students, and uh, looking at your record here, you shared 21 dissertations, uh, couple of folks that are becoming, or if not already, household names, uh, Bill McCarthy, Holly Foster, uh, Ruth Peterson, uh, Ross McMillan, uh, Winona Ryman Richmond. Um, yeah, and appropriately enough, uh, in 2012, uh, the ASA, the, uh, the Sociology of Law section bestowed upon you uh, the Ruth Peterson uh, Lauren Crevo uh, Mentoring Award. Can you speak yeah. to us a little bit about the, the, the mentoring process? Uh, how, what makes you so successful, uh, a mentor, in terms of guiding students along this pathway to, to ultimately ch achieving some of your success? Uh, hopefully, hopefully it, it was helpful. Uh, no, no doubt it was helpful to me. Um, I've always collaborated and wrote with other people. Yeah. When uh, as students and, and, and colleagues, and sometimes they, they're both. Yeah. You know? And uh, Ruth Peterson was an extraordinary and important person for me. I encountered Ruth when she was a graduate student uh, in the early 1980s at the University of Wisconsin. Ruth always tells me that we're the same age, and I know we're not, uh, but she's nice to say that. And uh, uh, we worked together. We, we published on uh, drug offenders, and that was really interesting for me because she really really clarified for me how you can sort of see things in terms of race and the criminal justice system. Um, and um, uh, I've been so enormously proud that Ruth has continued to do that work in yeah. such an extraordinarily successful way and has won the Edwin Sutherland yeah. Award and has served as president yeah. of the American Society of Criminology and uh, is doing important work with the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, so all of these students have been enormously, uh, former students have been enormously important for me, and uh, I've benefited enormously. Um, and if I've had success in doing it, I think it's because I've always thought of them not as students, but as collaborators. Huh. And um, uh, I think collaboration is a wonderful thing. I'm sometimes, you know, sometimes in, in 
it's, you know, tenure committees and so on, they talk about, well, is this the co-author paper, is single author paper, who's first, who's said, Yeah. Which always seemed to me to be totally crazy because, you know, the word college, you know, it comes out of colleagueship. Like collegiality. And collegiality and, yeah. and collaboration. Those are all interpenetrating, overlapping terms of yeah. people should be more rewarded, I think, for collaborating than for doing things on their own. Yeah. Uh, and that's the way I've always thought about it. Uh, so um, it's been very important for me. Okay. And that sounds like a, a tried and true response in that you're learning more from, from those that uh, you're working with than you're making even part. <laughs> it's kind of a, Absolutely. It's just a, Absolutely. an exciting process. Yeah. Uh, thinking back on your own career, uh, are there any, I, know, I hate to use the word regrets, but are, are there any, is there any element there that you wish you would have done more of this or had more of these, this skill set? Or uh, I always remember my colleague, Art Stinchcomb, when he retired, he said, you know, uh, I'm not stopping. I'm going to start over. I'm going to go back and apply for an assistant professor. <laughs> yes, uh, you know, once is not enough. Um, I like two careers. Uh, I regret that. Uh, I can have two careers. Uh, uh, but uh, do I have any regrets? Why? So often I found myself thinking, you know, I remember, I remember specifically walking down a street in Berlin. Uh, and I, I, did, I did a couple of pieces uh, when the wall came down. And, Berlin uh, with um, uh, Klaus Bonka and, and Hans Merkens, and one of them appeared in the American Journal of Sociology, and it was a very interesting work for me. <coughs> and I remember um, saying to myself at that time, I was walking down the street, I was saying, you know, stop now. That's good enough. You know, that's great. <laughs> it's better run. This has been fun. Uh, and I do keep, continue now to say that. Um, yeah. It's all great. And. Yeah. Um, well, it's not all great, no. There's nothing worse than, I, I want to say for posterity, there's nothing worse than rejection. Uh, and, and the only thing, you know, second to rejection in the list of bad things in a career is, is resubmission. <laughs> resubmission. And, uh, and, and, and I now grow back to be fond of the idea of conditional acceptance. Oh, uh, so, so do I have regrets? Yes, I regret all those rejections. <laughs> I regret uh, the amount of labor involved in revision and resubmission. Sure. Uh, I regret that sometimes when you finally come to the end of that process, if you're lucky enough to get it conditionally yeah. accepted, you can't quite of what you were doing when you started. <laughs> and uh, the challenge of putting papers aside and picking them up again uh, only gets more challenging yeah. as you get older, and um, so do I have regrets. But you, you've also been on the other side of the the, the desk, so to speak. There, in terms of as an editor, as an editor, as an editor. How how does that how does that process differ? I purposely chose to be editor of the annual review of law and social science, and I've actually been involved with annual reviews for, as you pointed out in the introduction, for I don't know twenty more than twenty years, yeah. I think. Um, and the great thing about that is you solicit articles uh -huh. and you almost never reject articles. You know, occasionally you have to, because both you and the author probably know that there would be an embarrassment. Yeah. But basically you're asking people to do their best work and they, they tend to do that. And, yeah. and so I haven't had to do that, uh, yeah. that form that role that involves 90% of the time telling people no. But who wants to do that? <laughs> well, I know we should honor so the sorry service to... of those who do that. But, but it's not a fun. It's a hard thing to do. Yeah. You have to. You know, some people are better at saying no than other people. Yeah. I always remember the dean I had at the law school at Toronto, who went on to become a Supreme Court justice. And you'd walk into his office to ask for something, and he'd say no, and and you'd come out feeling better than when you walked in. Oh, you know, a great that's, editor a, that's a heck can of a do skill. That. That's a heck of a skill. Some, yeah. some editors perfect that. Um, so they learn how to provide enough feedback. One of my first articles that for a long time, I think it is still the most cited article, was an article on Law and Society Review on Sentencing. It was rejected by Jim Short. Uh, <laughs> Jim, if you're yeah, watching, yeah. Uh, uh, for the American Sociological Review, but he gave yeah. a lot of good comments. All right. He said, you might think about Law and Society Review, which was just starting as a journal. All right. And that's where it got published, and it got cited a lot, and he was right, you know, that was where it belonged. Now, now as editor, 
I suspect, and especially as an editor that has the privilege of, of inviting in people mm -hmm. to react to different aspects of yeah. this thing, you have a sense of how the field has begun to, to develop over that course of time. Uh, can you give us some indication there in terms of maybe trends that have emerged and things that have come and maybe gone? And you know, the, the biggest thing that I've seen happen in American, American criminology is the rise of a quantitative tradition yeah. and the importance of that uh, in the field. Uh, almost all for the good, but sometimes inadvertently for the bad. Sure. And um, that's been a remarkable sort yeah. of feature of the evolution of our field. Yeah. Um, yeah. So would you suggest to, to, to future viewers of this next generation that uh, you, we, you, you would almost by necessity uh, have to have a quantitative toolkit? To um, what I would say about that is I do always look in my projects for an empirical right. core okay. as well as an interesting question and a theory. All right. I always sort of start that way. but yeah. Several times in my career, I've said, you know, it's really going to be all about the qualitative data, okay. data, not the not the quantitative side. Now, qualitative data is empirical. All right. And so, in Northern Passage, I interviewed an American, uh, a hundred American yeah. and war resistors. In Justice in the Balkans, I interviewed a hundred people who were working at the International Criminal Tribunal for right. former Yugoslavia. And the work in Iraq, you interviewed quite a few. Justices. There's a lot of yeah. uh, interviewing there. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. worked with 80 different judges who came to a uh, program in, in um, Central Europe. Uh, and we did an experimental design. With yeah. So lots of different ways to do things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and um, qualitative work and the interviewing is, is something I really like. Yeah. I really like. And um, I think I, I have. I come across as a non-threatening person, I think. Yeah. People have told me that. Yeah. And I, that helps in interviewing. Yeah. And uh, so so I like doing that. I okay. like doing that. And those books in particular were overwhelmingly qualitative. Right. And um, I found that really quite exciting work to do. Yeah. So, so no, I don't think you have to be quantitative. Uh, but there's no doubt that in our field, um, the rise of the quantitative tradition has been hugely important. Yeah. And it remains, in some ways, a part of the uh, the gatekeeping in the field yeah. in certain journals, and uh, and that's uh, it's important to recognize that. Sure, sure. Um, I see you more of a more in the vein of a, being a question guy, having unique observation or unique take. Or why aren't we thinking about this? And then you're the right. first to kind of leap into that uh, into that fissure. Are there things that you see sort of out on that, that vista or that horizon that, that you think criminology needs to begin moving its pieces in that direction and erecting some, some theoretical ideas? I've seen this with the, 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 the Darfur book. You're taking clearly criminological concepts uh, and inserting them into this new thing and trying to bring yeah. us in that direction. So I see my work um, yeah, as being focused on what I hope are important questions, yeah. policy questions, um, even more than theoretical questions. All right. <clears throat> and um, maybe I see my work a little bit in the way that as I came into the field I saw Robert Merton talking about middle range theory and right. C. Wright Mills talking about um, important policy questions. Okay. Uh, and um, so when I look forward, I don't, you know, s sort of imagine myself thinking how the internet or something like the internet will, or electric cars will All change right. society All right. uh, in the very long term. But I do see things that I think are neglected and extraordinarily important. Okay. So, for example, uh, the two main areas of my work now are international criminal law and on mass incarceration. Well, in international criminal law, we have moved into this period where, with the president, we focused on drones yeah. and sort of silent killing, yeah, right. extrajudicial killings, yeah. which is a whole different thing than conventional warfare. Yes. So we're not doing 
an invasion like in Iraq. Right. We're doing a lighter footprint. Aerial kind. bombing and drone and drone strikes. Mm -hmm. So I think that new kind of warfare, that alternative kind of warfare, yeah, uh, is very important to be studying that and understanding it in terms of international uh -huh. criminal law. And of course, this administration that has so pushed those new ways of doing war. Yeah. Notwithstanding that the president is a lawyer, yeah, have totally resisted seeing it in that way. Yeah, you know we have had an administration that has co-opted international criminal law figures like Samantha Power and Susan Rice, and has resisted completely cooperating with the International Criminal Court. Yeah, and has consistently taken the view that when probable crimes occur, yeah. uh, instead we put them aside and move on. Okay. And I think that's extraordinarily important. Yeah. On the mass incarceration side, we could end mass incarceration tomorrow yeah. and we would still, for at least another generation or two, experience the consequences for children. Yeah. It's extraordinarily important to focus on what those consequences are throughout those lives. And so we're entering hopefully an era of re-entry, yeah. uh, return of prisoners to communities, and hopefully this will signal a whole yeah. new kind of body of work. As much as we're aware of both of those things, drone warfare yeah. and prisoner re-entry, there's very little work on them. Yeah. And what work is being done on them is very seldom done by criminologists. And I think we definitely will get to the re-entry work. Okay. We have the leadership of people like Jeremy Travis, and Bruce Western and their National Academy of Sciences report that it is not just about mass incarceration but also yeah. about re-entry. And so I think uh, we'll, we'll see that. I'm a, lot, a little less optimistic about the international criminal law side, but I well, remain why is hopeful. Um, well, I think it has a lot to do with who the next president is. Oh, uh, right. That's, uh, you know, the, the initiative that needs to be taken we got into the international criminal law yeah. side of things with uh, former Yugoslavia and Rwanda because it came with the decline of the Soviet Union yeah. and decline of fear of that. Yeah. And a president who was uh, also a lawyer. Yeah. Um, was Bill Clinton a lawyer? He was, uh, Yale. University. Yale Law School, yeah, of course. Yeah, right, 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 right. Of course. So someone who knew the importance of law and could be persuaded yeah. to do something along those lines. And ironically, George Bush even actually continued, you know, we yeah. provide um, about $500 million a year to keep those two tribunals that we were so central in starting, yeah. keep them going. Um, and Bush did that. Yeah. Um, and um, it's only now that we're kind of closing them down and refusing to participate. Yeah and the International Criminal Court. Um, so it depends on so, so okay. much on who's the president. Well, well it may be if Hillary Clinton is president, instead of a lawyer like yeah. Barack Obama, maybe Hillary Clinton will see the value of doing it. Or maybe at the end of the Obama administration, people like Samantha Power and Susan Rice will prevail yeah. on Barack Obama and, and take some leadership role in that. It could still happen. I'm wondering if it's just not about just power. It doesn't matter who you insert into these particular positions. It's it's a power issue as opposed to well, okay. power and fear. Yeah. yeah, it's all about power and yeah. fear. And powerful people fear losing their right. power. And I and see that, I see that theme in uh, who are the criminals. It's sort of a, po a pox on all their houses. Yeah, you know, it's kind of the attitude right. through through yeah. the stages. There's always this hope, and then it's dashed, and then we move on to the next. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and. Um, I think a big factor in the Obama administration has been the idea that people who try to do international criminal law are prone to being called, you know, giving in to world government no, or right. something like okay. that, the old Jesse Helms argument. Yeah. And um, losing sovereignty, you know, losing autonomy. Yeah, you know, there's there's this idea of the third rail of politics. Yeah. Social Security reform is, was one of those, but we actually did a lot of Social Security reform eventually, yeah. and it's been helpful. Uh, Health care was a third rail. Yeah. Uh, Rahm Emanuel is widely known to have advised 
uh, Barack Obama not to do affordable health care. He okay. did it. Yeah. That was the one he took on. Okay. International criminology, criminal law was what he didn't. Okay. It was the choice, the path, path not taken. taken. Path not taken. All right. We didn't do anything about Darfur yeah. uh, in the Bush administration and, and also in the, in the Obama administration. We did do Iraq in the All Bush right. administration, yeah. and we've continued to be involved in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, okay. Syria, and so yeah. on, Somalia, uh, uh, Ukraine. You know, yeah. it's now sort of you know the worst fears associated with invading yeah. Iraq are, are realized, and uh, but we're not approaching them on international criminal law terms, except when it suits us. So we say, for okay. example, in the public sector, we say. You know, Russia is violating international criminal law right. by having forces in Ukraine. But we don't summon the resources of the International Criminal Court to do yeah. something about yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, part of me is wondering if we're bound to repeat the cycle that you mentioned earlier with the sort of the waning interest in the immediate aftermath of World War II for dealing with those things. You see sort of the ebb in, for instance, uh, to take one of your examples, the mass incarceration binge. And I suspect that that might be moving us in the direction of the newer shiny object, uh, where this will be kind of neglected in some sense. The, the kind of meshes with this idea of politics being very much as a centerpiece in what criminology does. Is that taking things too far, maybe, or is that no, it's not taking and things too far? All right. <laughs> okay. And who are the criminals? I strongly argue. Yeah. No that the Reagan administration, the age of Reagan, changed yeah. everything. Yeah. It was a shift, wholesale shift, from the sort of earlier age of Roosevelt. Yeah. We'd like the age of Obama to be something different. Right. In many ways, it still heeds the lessons of the age of Reagan. And okay. Obama himself, as yeah. a candidate, talked about his admiration for, he actually said that Reagan was a more transformative president than Bill Clinton. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's, says a lot yeah. um, about what is avoided and about what, okay. what is, what's chosen and not chosen. All right. uh, so, um, so you're right, yeah. to, you know, the politics of the day, as yeah. uh, Joachim Stavelsberg's work and yeah. some of your work, yeah. has shown, um, yeah. very much drives what we do as criminologists. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to think otherwise, and um, I'd like to think as a field that Part of our further maturation is insulating ourselves more from politics. Okay. But we have been, the, yeah. the, you know, the past so far yeah. is very much influenced by politics. Okay. Yeah. Um, any thoughts on sort of the general health of the state of the, the field of criminology these days? Oh, I think it's it's phenomenally healthy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, as a discipline. Yeah. Uh, um, and having its, its, its base particularly in colleges and universities. Okay. You know, we began, as I did at, at university, state universities yeah. being the schools that would have criminology yeah. programs. You know? Um, well, you, have, you came out of a social program that had a couple of criminologists cent you know, centrally, there, right? That's, that's right. Yeah. Dan Glazer, David Borgia, yeah. John Clark. Um, Rob Sampson taught at the University of Illinois yeah. Yeah. after I left. Well, they, they, were, but they represented a tradition there. Yes. Ben Land, you know, a number of people, important people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so we have we have had like Ohio State University, yeah. Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa. You know, we've had an Washington. anchor in, in yeah. the Big Ten schools. Yeah. Now we've got an anchor in the elite schools. Um, All right. Uh, Harvard has. Uh, sure. You know, Rob Sampson, <laughs> Bruce Western, Diva Pager, Kathy Eden. Okay. Um, you know, we have a number of the uh, Matt Desmond, younger scholar, uh, doing wonderful uh, work there. Uh, I think that's we're here to stay. Okay. You know, we've yeah. arrived. <laughs> we've we've gotten to a certain point uh, as a discipline. Yeah. And uh, so I have every confidence in the institutional success of our field Perfect. and encourage everybody to pursue it, if, not, <laughs> if, if only for that reason. But I think there are other things we can do better right. and bigger. Okay. And part of that is gaining an independence from the politics. That, okay. You know, it's very prominent in American universities, our corporate boards are yeah. big influence now. Any thoughts um, on how we might effectuate that? How we make that happen? Yeah. Because I have some ideas of my own, maybe. How to make that happen? 
it would seem like uh, the funding streams are going back to, to Savile's birds. Well, one of the most important partial. things that's yeah. happened in, in recent years was uh, John Lau being selected yes. as director of the National Institute of Justice, yeah. and now Nancy Rodriguez. And Jim Lynch. Uh, Jim Lynch yeah. has a big role in, yeah. in, that, in that program. Uh, so, you know, there, there are really important signs there. The okay. law, the social science program at the National Science Foundation has yeah. provided a lot of support, and those programs have a fair degree of, of independence. I'd like them to have more, okay. but they have a fair degree of independence. Yeah. Um, and so the funding streams are very important, but I think also it's attracting people into the field who are uh -huh. driven only by the funding streams. Okay. And what I see, especially in the program, tenure. you know, you see what's going on in your own place, yeah. particularly in Northwestern. We have a large number of students interested in international topics now, okay. in sociology, law, and crime, and particularly in crime. And uh, that's, uh, I think, those students tend to be more independent in the sense that they like to do a lot of their work other places, and yeah. they're not expecting that they're going to get funding to do that necessarily, huh. and they're good at grabbing onto what funding they can find, and, <laughs> and, and especially programs you know, like Fulbright's. And okay. There are programs that, that support uh, social science research council. Um, uh, a lot of graduate schools set aside money for international work. All right. uh, the uh, Buffett family has just uh, given huh. Northwestern University $100 million to support international work, yeah. to, a, to establish a global studies institute. So right. there are real opportunities going forward. And funding streams make a difference, and that's one funding stream yeah. that is going in the right direction. All right. Uh, I suppose with that, uh, sort of the survey of, of your own work, uh, uh, as well as that going on with the larger breadth of the field, uh, barring any uh, any issues that uh, you'd like to have on the record? Their parting thoughts? Uh, um, I, I'd only say that this uh, use of oral history is, I think, extremely important. Right. And uh, we've had earlier forms of it. Yes. Uh, John Lowe, particularly important in oral history work, and others have as well. Yeah. It's not a field that I know as well as I, I should, but uh, I think this, uh, you know, uh, we can only go into the future, learning from the lessons of the past. Yeah. If, if we if we do remember things accurately right. and fully, and I think oral histories are uh, a unique opportunity to do this. So right. thank you well, for we this opportunity. We appreciate your uh, your contribution here as well. So very welcome. With that, thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll sign off. Thank you. <laughs>